Somebody goes, oh, well, on my three-day week, I can just skip a day and have a five-day weekend. I mean, I think you're inviting a lot of problems with that style. As well as saying, oh, well, we need to bump up our employee count by half. Like, that's a lot. That's a lot of people to hire on all at once. It is. Friends, it's your buddy Phil here, project management trainer. Did you hit record? I, I did actually hit record. Thank right. you for asking that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. We are on the final stretch uh, for project management, and I think that's good news for all of us, right? The holidays are coming up. Some of you will work through them and make a lot of money. Some of you will work through them and make not so much money. And some of you will take some time off and get to see uh, family and personal stuff. So whatever, whichever way it is you're doing that, uh, enjoy the holidays. And we will talk again on Tuesday, and I will give you a take-home exam to work on. And on Tuesday, we will go over the answers to the 124-question uh, exam questions that I gave you last class. That is posted on Canvas as well and uh, you can pick them up there, but I will give, we will go over the answers. And so you kind of get an idea. Tonight, we're gonna do two things. Uh, one of them, uh, more questions, but we'll do this by video rather than by uh, take home and looking them all up. Uh, these questions, if you watch the video that we had posted on Canvas, it was kind of not a required assignment, uh, but if you watch that, it's the same guy uh, and, and uh, uh, he does quite a bit of training on, on PMP, and if you kind of like the style and you want to dig deeper or dive deeper, uh, that's free stuff that's out there that you can do. And, and I think that, you know, uh, there's, there's uh, we all learn, I don't teach anybody anything. You all learn because you choose to learn something. You discover it and learn on your own. Uh, we talk about it in class, possibly, and I'll, I'd love to be able to teach stuff, but humans don't learn that way. They learn because we choose to learn as human beings and we we discover it and our learning styles are all different and lecture like we do in this class is the worst and and i apologize for that but that's the way our uh, education system in the world pretty much at least in the united states it's the way it works and uh maybe someday well, you can be instrumental in better ways of teaching people stuff uh, because uh, you need it at work we need to teach people that we hire when we look at turnover in our businesses turnover uh, puts a challenge to all of us. Uh, turnover in the United States, I just read some numbers, 19 months is the average turnover of all workers in the United States. 19 months. That's just beyond a bit, a year and a half. Uh, and I think it would be safe if you wanted to round up a little bit, say every two years people change jobs. That doesn't mean they change companies always but they change the job they do in that company. They get promoted or moved around to some other task, the company buys or expands or does something different, so the job changes. And I think maybe you can look back at your own career and say, is that kind of true? And, and even if you didn't change companies, did the stuff you have to do change? Then if that's it, then, then we fit in that same national average numbers. Even the President of the United States usually only keeps a job for four years, right? We have, we have a few that, that squeak it out and get get double, uh, double terms, and every now and then we have a, we've had a, a Bush family in the, in the, the history that, that got 12 years, that's, that that's a, was a fluke, that was the only time that ever happened, right? Where it, we had one family influencing the office uh, of the President of the United States for that long. But even the President of the United States, uh, regardless of whether you support them or don't support them, the President of the United States is new at his job. We don't hire experienced presidents. We don't go, you know, help wanted, president of the United States. 
uh, you know, must have prior experience. You know, it, 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 we, we don't do that. So even the president has to go in and learn his job. So that means teaching is extremely critical for all of us. Even if you're at the level of the White House of the United States, teaching is an important thing. And we have, we have circumstances. We have the city manager in the, in the, the city of St. George in a turnover spot right now. We have the Washington city manager. And, and if you know how, how municipalities work, we have an elected mayor that doesn't do anything in any town in the United States. I mean, they get, they get the news interviews and you know, they spout and sputter and, 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 and have a walk you know, where everybody gets together or a 5K or something in their name. And I don't mean that the job of being mayor is easy, but the mayor does not run the city. The, the mayor is an elected official that tries to represent the interests of the people to the city council who is also represented and then the city manager makes it all happen or doesn't. And if you, if you don't think that's a uh, reasonably important job, uh, it's public information what we pay city managers in all cities in the United States. And, and you ought to maybe Google that and look it up for uh, a little bit of uh, high blood pressure if you want. Uh, the city manager in St. George makes over half a million dollars a year. It's a nice job. We're talking about, you know, the difference between $10 an hour and $20 an hour. How many dollars an hour is $500,000 a year? That's a lot of money per hour. So if you screw off and leave work early and you're the city manager, you're costing us a whole bunch of money that you're not, you know, we're paying you to do. I wouldn't want you to expect you there. And, you know, the, and so that position's in churn right now here locally. So what that means is, and, and that person wasn't in that job for but just a few years, uh, was replacing uh, someone who had been in a job for a little bit longer period of time. And, and uh, you know, we, we are looking at turnover all around us, and we are looking at, and, and Andrew, you, you said something before class. If somebody makes it, what, eight six months? months? How much? Six months. Six months, they'll tend to stay? Two years. Two years, and if they make it two years, they tend to stay? Five. And if they stay five years, they get this class. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we get to meet you. <laughs> I mean, everybody here is probably, everybody here from Wyoming is 10 plus. Yeah, so so that's that's cool, by the way. I think it's very cool. And it's cool for Wyoming that, that you've got that rudder of tribal knowledge that's not filtering out. Because when you think about turnover at the steel uh, facilities, both St. George Steel and s, &S Steel, those are really hard jobs, uh, hard work, body can't take it, male or female, uh, for extended years. It's just punishing. You know, it's like, you know, NFL quarterbacks have to quit at like age, unless you're brave, right? You know, they, they, they don't make it into their 30s a lot of times, right? Uh, because that job's hard. It's hard on your body. And uh, the, the, the turnover, when you're in a spot like that where turnover is, is high, how do you manage projects with untrained people? You know, training and teaching is a huge part. And so here we're teaching the teachers. We're teaching, you know, how do you be a project manager? That's what we've been talking about in this class. And really what it comes down to is you, how do you become a teacher? Project management is about understanding the project itself and then teaching everybody that's related to the project what they need to do in order to make the project successful. And you have to do that without having the authority to be the teacher. When nobody's hired you to actually officially be the teacher. You're the whipping boy in a lot of cases. You're set up by the owner to, if the project goes south, you're the guy who gets fired. Uh, and, and, and you kind of know that going into the project. You've got to get good at it. Do you have a number? Two hundred and sixty dollars an hour. Two hundred and sixty dollars an hour. Yes, that's two sixty point four one. Yeah, think of the tax problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think even after you subtract out the tax, and we have a lot of people in America are making that money. Uh, we just don't have enough of us making that kind of money. I think is is the problem. But it's out there for everybody, right? If you get your skill sets together, uh, we have an awful lot of millionaires in the United States. A lot more than any other country in the world. And so opportunities there for those of you that, uh, that line up your skill sets and, and, and demonstrate your ability uh, to, to do things beyond what your, your colleagues can do. And those people in the end ultimately just about always get rewarded one way or the other. 
And, and some of the people that have failed businesses the most times are some of the richest people in the United States because they've learned every time they failed, uh, they didn't stop, they, they retooled and did it over again and did it better, did it over again, did it better. And you know, we all know people like that, that had a, had a, 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 a biff, they, you know, they hit, hit a wall and their business closed and they somehow pivoted and became successful again. That's not because their business is successful, that's because they got skills. And they've got skills from learning stuff like we're trying to cover here. So tonight we have two things to do. We're gonna hear more questions and uh, some answers. These ones are, are tilted towards agile uh, and, and uh, we, we have not spent near as much enough time as I'd like to spend on this short few weeks course really uh, to, to dive deeper into Agile, but we've talked about it enough that you've got a feeling of what Scrum is about, uh, what backlogs are about, what, uh, what the, the concepts are behind Agile, and, and uh, we haven't talked much about artifacts, and artifacts is something that you know, but we, you don't use that word for it. An artifact is what are the documents that are necessary to keep track of as you go through a project. And so it's the tables, the tools, the backlogs. Those are the remaining pieces of paper when the project's are over, when you go into the file, those are artifacts. The, some of the artifacts are the blueprints if you're building a, uh, if it's a construction project. It's software code if you're writing software. It's the project plan or the project development plan or the, uh, that, that if you're in the manufacturing setting. And, and so in the ISO world, I've just been helping a company uh, that's, that's working on their, uh, their product development plans. There are four, five phases uh, counting uh, commercialization of a project uh, in, in uh, FDA terms. So if you're making a medical device, a new artificial heart or something like that, you have to have uh, the design phase and, and all of the development documented in a specific sequence. The artifacts are what those documents are. And so uh, artifacts of the Civil War are the remaining pieces of evidence that the Civil War occurred. So you can kind of use the word artifact that way. If we, if we go out and explore Gettysburg uh, or a battlefield, a famous Civil War battlefield, and some of you have done that, you'll find artifacts. You find uh, these, these stone bullets that were what they shot out of the muskets and there's, they're laying all over the place. There were 50,000 people in that battle and they were shooting <laughs> at each other and, and people were getting wounded and died, more died in that battle than any other battle in the United States history. It was a bloody, bloody uh, battle. And artifacts are everywhere if you go explore that area that, that document the, the evidence of what happened. And, and uh, so with your project, the artifacts are the documented evidence of what happened after your project is over. You collect them along the way and you uh, have certain ones you purposely know that you need to have in place. Like we talked about risk register. And a risk register is evidence that you talked about specific risks to the project throughout the project. And so you'll develop artifacts that have to do with risk. You'll develop artifacts that have to do with cost. Uh, when you pay a check, when you write checks out and make payables, you keep track of what you're spending. When you put, fill out time cards and look at labor allocations, you are creating artifacts that are uh, part of the history of that project that you can go back and learn from. And so hopefully you do differently for the next project. You can see what, what you didn't like and what you do like. So we are going to take this quiz uh, together and I promise you that I, I'd like you to, I, the, the, the test goes slow. What he does is he puts three a question with three possible answers. Now in the PMP test, there's always four possible that's their format. Uh, he puts just three up. And I think three is an effective study tool as well because in the PMP, <coughs> as I've looked at it, one of, some of you have studied how to take tests. And, and uh, I, I like the people that at, at the college level do that. Uh, there's kind of clubs around the United States where they arbitrarily will take a test that nobody has studied for or done uh, or is qualified to take and see how close they can come to passing it. Like, I mean, people sit and take the bar exam without having any, any law school training. Just how could, how would I do, you know, if I took the bar exam? 
uh, and people take the, the real estate license test uh, without any, any, any of the class training. See how close they could come to passing that test just from street knowledge that they have without study. Now, of course, if they pass, they don't get qualified. It's a, it's a, it's a game that these guys play. Uh, I mean, they take the med cats, the medical, you know, to get their doctors, become a doctor, you know, they take the, they, and, and, and what they're doing is they're studying the science of writing tests and figuring out right answers on a test without knowing. So on the PMP, almost always you can read the four answers and you can eliminate one right off the bat with your, your knowledge. You could go, I know it's not that one. Just the way they worded the test or the way that the answer is or it's a ridiculous answer. And you go, okay, you can line one of them out. So you got three left usually that you gotta, okay now, which one of these is the real deal? And, and we can take tests without studying and sometimes have some level of success. And Andrew, you were saying we need 61% on PMP. Is that what you said last time? 61%. Yeah. 61%. So that means that you really only need to get six out of 10 right. Um, he's challenging us today to see if we can get 70%. So that is uh, only missing three out of 10. And so kind of keep track of your answers on a blank piece of paper. I've got blank paper right here if you want uh, to get some. Uh, I'm, you're not going to turn it in. This is just for you to kind of keep score uh, if you want. Pass those around. You just grab a sheet if you want. Um, and then after we have done that, we are going to, uh, we've got laptops in the back of the room. I want everybody to get a laptop at that point in time. And from uh, the laptop, we are going to log into a project management simulation. Those of you that are gamers uh, in the room will maybe enjoy this part. Uh, MIT has developed a project management simulation program uh, that we are going to be, be in trying out for free. Uh, it has three possible scenarios, a construction project, a, a manufacturing a product, hardware uh, uh, product, or uh, working on a software package. So you can pick which of those three types of projects you want to take on, and then you in the simulation will uh, go through labor deployment, uh, you'll have budgets, and the simulations will be from between 60 weeks and 75 weeks each time you change the parameters as you would want as a project manager, and you can accelerate, you can retire, you can, you can uh, limit scope, you can broaden scope, you can do things with your project to try to bring it in on time or ahead of time, on budget or under budget, and it will keep score for you at the end. You get a report out and see if you were successful. Uh, then if you uh, don't like the way your scores are, you can do it again. You know, you can you know, get, you reset it and go over it and do it again. And this will be something that you'll be able to do from home as well. We're going we're gonna to do it in class enough that uh, you have a, that you will do it in, in groups of two or three, so you kind of help each other figure out the game and, and learn how it goes. And then I'm going to want you to uh, go through a cycle on your own um, as, as the, a, a, a piece of the final exam. The, 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 the written part that you're going to work on is all open book and everything, and, and, and uh, you'll have till January to turn it in. And with this simulation, uh, I want to report, I want to, uh, a snapshot photograph of the scoreboard of your final uh, iteration on the game at a time when you're satisfied with your score. So you may do it five or six times. You may change to a different simulation and do uh, manufacturing instead of a construction or whatever you want to choose to do. Take a picture of it, send it in to me, and then I will give you credit for that one. So we'll start that out today in the class uh, after we've watched this video. And then when you feel like you've got the game, go home. Uh, so the, we'll spend probably uh, 40 minutes or so on the video together, then we'll pass out the laptops and you can start that. When you think, I got the game, I understand it, we can go home at that point. Okay? So let's start our, our quiz. Hello, my friends. It's your buddy Phil here, project management training coach. Today, we're going to play a game called The Power of Three. 
the power of three, my main objective is to find any gaps in your knowledge for the PMP exam. I'm also going to be working to help you fine tune your focus on things that might have been blind spots. Okay? So, to play this game, it's going to be closed book. It's going to be about a minute per question. The cool thing about this game is, unlike the actual exam, this is like training wheels. You're only going to have three options, and that's why I call it the power of three. All right? Some of the questions are going to be elementary, and then as we go further, we're going to step it up. Are you ready? Let's get into it. Here's your first question. Okay, he's going to leave that up for about 45 seconds or 60 seconds. You can talk to each other about this. If you're sitting somebody, by somebody, talk out loud uh, about what you think, but I want you to put what you think the answer is. I promise you, on some of these that look obvious and you think you know, you'll get them wrong. And that's part of why we want to do this, is so that you'll, you'll, you'll learn the, the right thinking, because he'll explain uh, about each one. And we've talked about almost all of these in class. All right, three, two, and one. The answer to this question, my friends, what comes first on an Agile project? It's not the team charter. It's not the assumption log. It's the Agile project charter, because that is what gives the vision and the understanding of what the project is all about. All right? Let's go to our next question. Who is accountable for backlog prioritization and management? I'll give you a minute for this one as well. We've talked about all three of these, scrum master, the product owner, and the team. You might be able to eliminate one by looking at it. If you can eliminate two, you know the answer. accountable for backlog management, I can tell you it's not the Scrum Master and it's not the team. This is the job of the product owner. The product owner is a person who is responsible and accountable for doing this. Now the product owner could bring in other people to participate as people who uh, give ideas when it comes to prioritization and management, when it comes to backlog refinement. But the ultimately answerable person is the product owner. All right, let's go to our next question. Here's your next one. What should be done after developing a charter? I'll give you about a minute. three, two, and one. So after you have developed a project charter, the next thing you should do is actually not procurement selection, and it's not the detailed scope. You first of all want to identify stakeholders. Remember, you are in initiating. So the first thing you would do out of these options is identify the stakeholders. Let's go to our next question. What should be done after developing a project charter? Well, I guess it's almost like the same <clears throat> question. I'll give you some time to think about it.
right, three, two, and one. You don't need that much time because you just looked at something similar. So let's think about it. You're done with the project charter. Do you close out the project immediately? No, you don't. Do you immediately begin to generate reports after creating the charter? Or would you first of all work on detailed scope, which happens in planning? Yes, you would. You would do the detailed scope. So the answer to that is detailed scope. All right, let's go to our next question. Who is accountable for performing the project work? I'll give you a minute. That was more than enough time. Three, two, and one. Person who is accountable for performing the work is not one person, it is the team. And when you see team, I know those of you who are more in depth into the world of Scrum, you hear the word developers. Well, that's exactly what this means. You've got to be ready to roll with the language you're given on the PMP exam. It's not going to be exactly as it is in the Scrum Guide or in other literature you've read. So you need to be able to compare what is being said to what the PMI uh, calls it. So if PMI says uh, team, you know that means developers. If PMI says team facilitator, you know that would mean scrum master and so on. All right, so it's not the scrum master or the product owner, it's the team. They do the work. All right, here's your next question. Who is responsible for facilitating the daily scrum and retrospective meetings? I'll let you think about it. Three, two, and one. All right, so let's take a look. Who is responsible for facilitating the daily scrum? It might shock you. It says facilitating the daily scrum and retrospective meetings. Well, did you know that the product owner does not need to be in the daily scrum? We would want the product owner to be in the retrospective zone. It might shock you, but the scrum master just needs to ensure that the daily scrum was held. They are not responsible for facilitating, neither do they need to be there. It's not one of their core roles. So my friends, the answer to this, the best answer, is team. The team should be able to facilitate. After a while, maybe not at the beginning, but after a while they will, but it's not one of the core roles of the scrum master or core responsibilities of the scrum master to be the facilitator. Do they do it on a lot of projects? Yes, they do. But experienced Scrum Masters know that after a while, the team should begin to facilitate its own daily scrums. And also, the retrospective doesn't need to be facilitated by the Scrum Master alone, right? So this is more of a team thing. All right, I know that one's gonna shock some of you, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Well, let's go to our next one. 
who acts as a team coach? I'll let you think about it. as a team coach well you probably figured it out that's the scrum master the scrum master coaches a team to excellence great job here's your next one who is the business representative I'll let you think about it Let's take a look. The answer to this is none other than, of course, the product owner. We often call them the chief value officer of the record, right? Just as a fun term. We also call them the mouthpiece for the business. So product owner is a business representative. Here's your next one. What should be done after developing a charter? Similar to what you saw before, I'll give you a minute. All right, three, two, and one. So what should be done after developing the charter? The answer, my friends, is not to close out the project. And it would not be a change request because all you've done is develop the charter. The best answer is you would plan the project. So you develop the charter, then you go into planning. That would be the best answer, okay? Here's your next one. Which artifact comes first in Scrum. Right, three, two, and one. The answer to this, my friends, is what is at the very beginning. And it's not the increment, it's not the spread log. At the very beginning, you have the product backlog. It's not the sprint backlog, it's the product backlog. 
that exists first in Scrum. That is where all of the customer and stakeholder requests go right up front. All right, here's your next question. Which artifact comes last in Scrum? Take a best guess, go for it. my friends three two and one the artifact that comes last is not the product backlog or the spring backlog it's the increment that's what you get at the end of the sprint so it's worded a bit quickly but it's worded to make you think all right so your increment will be the last thing you get in a scrum sprint all right let's go to our next one who can modify a sprint Right, three, two, and one. The answer to this is not the Scrum Master. They can't do that. Our architect is a bogus one thrown in here from somewhere else. The answer is the product owner. The product owner can modify a sprint. All right, so far, I hope you're enjoying these questions. Go ahead, hit the like button if you are. Share with your friends. It's very important that they know that this information is out there. Now, this is pretty much for intermediate to even a little bit of advanced level. So the questions here, even though they are written in a very elementary one-liner kind of way, they could really help some of your friends find their gaps really quickly. All right, here's your next question. Which comes first? Scoping out the project, the project schedule, or detailed cost for each activity? I'll give you a minute to think about it. All right, three, two, and one. That should be enough. I know that it's a little bit of a uh, predictive one. So first thing you would do on a project is not detailed cost, because in order to do detailed cost, you would need a breakdown of activities, which takes us to project schedule. And in order to get a project schedule, you would need to know what the scope is, so you break it down into a WBS and into a list of activities which will help create your schedule so the best answer is scoping out the project let's go to our next question which comes first closing out a project closing out closing out a phase closing out a project closing a contract in a phase think about it
three, two, and one. All right, let's take a look. So, closing out a phase would need to happen before closing out a project. So we can go ahead and cancel closing out a project. That wouldn't come first. Closing out a phase would come first. But before closing out a phase, what would happen is closing out a contract in a phase. So the best answer that I was looking for is number three, closing a contract in a phase. All right, here's your next one. Which of these can be used when identifying stakeholders? Is it a stakeholder register, stakeholder plan, or MPS? Think about it. Well, my friends, three, two, and one. So the answer to this, when you're identifying stakeholders, what you could use to capture the stakeholders is not the plan that will come after. And net promoter score is really a score of how likely it is for your stakeholders to recommend you to associated businesses or the associates. So it's not that. The best answer is stakeholder register. It's that simple. The stakeholder register is an output of identifying stakeholders. Let's go on to our next one. The next one says, which of these is a two-dimensional tool for identifying stakeholders? Think about it. That's enough. Three, two, and one. Let's take a look. So, which of these is a two-dimensional tool? Well, a stakeholder cube is a three-dimensional tool. Remember, the stakeholder cube has the power, the interest, and it could also have the attitude of the stakeholder. So, it takes the power interest grid and it throws in a third dimension of attitude. So, it's not the stakeholder cube. The stakeholder engagement assessment matrix, which I just call the scene, is not a two-dimensional tool. It's really just a table. And on that table, you have this mnemonic, earns <coughs> less. You've got to remember that. You have unaware, resistant, neutral, supportive, and leading. And then you have in each of those fields as appropriate, C for current, and D for desired, right? D, desired, means that stakeholder is right where you left them. So it's not the seam. The seam is more like a, if you will, a uh, 
kind of matrix, uh, kind of like the register, and uh, we uh, don't use the scene in the identify stakeholders process. We use the scene in planning stakeholder engagement. That's why it's called stakeholder engagement assessment matrix. So it's not that. The answer is, of course, the power interest grid, and make sure you know the other terms for it, influence impact grid, so on and so forth. All right, let's move on to your next question. Which threat response approach takes probability or impact to zero? All right, my friends, let's end this one. So, which threat response takes probability of impact to zero? You probably figured out that the answer is not accept. That will keep the response, uh, that will keep the probability or impact exactly as they are. Uh, it's not mitigate. Mitigate is not one that takes them to zero. It will reduce the probability or impact, either one or both, but it would not take it to zero. The one that would take it to zero, either one, is avoid. Avoid will either take probability to zero, or take the impact to zero, or take both to zero. All right, so avoidance is the best answer. Let's go to your next one. Which opportunity response approach takes probability to 100%? All right, three, two, and one. The answer to this, my friends, is not share, and it's not enhance. The best answer, exploit. Exploit is the opportunity response approach that takes probability to 100%, and make sure that that opportunity absolutely does happen. The answer is exploit. All right, let's move on to your next one. Next question. Which risk response reduces a threat's probability or impact?
right, three, two, and one. The answer to this, which risk response reduces a threat probability, we're talking about reduction, so it's not accept. Accept doesn't reduce anything. It's not avoid. Avoid is an absolute removal of that thing, probability or impact-wise, it's not that. The best answer, talking about a reduction, is mitigate. Mitigate will reduce the probability or impact of a threat. Avoid will take the impact or probability to a zero. So there is a difference. Best answer is mitigate. All right, here is your next question. Which opportunity response approach increases impact or probability? All right, three, two, and one. So we're talking about which opportunity response approach increases impact or probability. The best one here is not share, and it's not accept. Accept does nothing. It's enhance. Enhance increases the impact or probability. Remember. We're talking about opportunities here. So this is what we want to increase, the opportunities, probability, or impact. Here's your next one. You put aside some money to deal with the risk if it happens. Which risk response is this? I'll give you a minute. Alrighty then, three, two, and one. So using the process of elimination as we always do, we're talking about dealing with the risk if it happens. Mitigate deals with the risk before it happens, not if it happens, right? A workaround is a response that was not initially planned, right? The best answer in terms of putting aside some money, which is in some way a little bit more proactive than not doing anything at all, is still accept. If you put some money aside to deal with the risk, if it happens, it's not a workaround because you've already kind of made a response in some way by putting the money aside, but it's not the most proactive response, but it is a response. We refer to that as accepted because you're not doing anything except the risk does happen. So it's not proactive, you're accepting it, but if it happens, there's some money put aside. We'll talk about that one in a little bit. Here's your next question. Uh-oh, it's the same one. <laughs> you put aside some money to deal with the risk if it happens. Which risk response is this? Ah, now you see where I'm going. 
I'm going to give you a minute. Go for it. Three, two, and one. So you probably guessed or done your research. Management reserves, they're not used for known arrest, right? They're not used for things that we've identified up front. No. And you've got passive accept, which is doing absolutely nothing. But putting aside some money, that is active accept. I'm sure some of you got that right in a second. Let's move to our next one. A document in which contract types and mode of payment is described is what? I did expect that to go quick. The answer is, believe it or not, not this thing, which doesn't really exist, a contract charter, no such thing. And it's not the procurement plan, as uh, some of you might have thought, no. Procurement management plan does not contain this stuff. Contract types, mode of payment, all that, you'd find it in a procurement strategy, all right? More than a procurement all right, well, let's go to our next question. And then if you want to check this out, make sure you look at the outputs in the guide in 12.1, the outputs. This is an output in the sixth edition known as procurement strategy. All right, let's move on. Here's your next question. Which of these is a communication method? This is going to go quick. Three, two, one. The best answer, my friends, is not email, and it's not tone of voice. The best answer is push. Remember, we have three types of communication methods. Okay, it is not uh, email or tone of voice. The, the best answer is push. Here's your next one. Which of these is a communication method? Uh-oh, here we go again. Three, two, one. The answer is not text and it's not words. The answer is interactive. So you have push, pull, and interactive. Those are the three communication methods. All right, just a bit of trivia to spice it up. Here we go. An attribute of quality to be measured is what? Three, two, one. The answer, it's not measurement. That's not an attribute. That's an actual thing you measure. And it's not defect. That's a thing. The attribute, the best word, is metric. The metric is an attribute that you measure. Next question. The cost of upholding quality throughout the product life is called what? If you need more time, always hit the pause button. Three, two, one. The answer is not cost of production, and it's not appraisal cost, because appraisal cost 
is also included in this one called the cost of quality, which is the correct answer. So the cost of quality is the life of the product. We're talking about the quality throughout the product life and the cost of upholding that. Just like warranty work, it's part of the product life and so on and so forth. All right, here we go. Next one. Which metric is best for checking cost performance? If you need more time, hit the pause button. Three, two, one. The best answer is not the schedule performance index and it's not the cost variance. The cost variance is not the best because it shows you a variance, but it doesn't show you the variance in comparison with the overall budget. The cost performance index on the flip side takes a look at what you have spent to date and what you have accomplished. So the best metric is that. That's why it's called cost performance index. All right, so the indices are usually better when you're checking performance. Here's your next one. Which metric is best for checking schedule performance? Schedule performance, you knew it wasn't that. And based on what I told you, performance, that's a trick. It's not schedule variance because schedule variance just shows us a variance. But again, it's not in comparison with anything that has been necessarily uh, budgeted in total. Uh, or it's not really in comparison with the schedule performance. So remember, the schedule performance index is the earned value, which kind of holds the performance in some way, but when you juxtapose it with planned value, it helps you see the accomplishment in comparison with the plan for what you should have accomplished by a particular date. This just shows you the difference between these two, EV minus PV. So it doesn't really show you what the performance is because you could have a schedule variance of $5, for example. If the schedule variance is $5, that could be on any project. It could be on a $1 million project. It could be on a $200 project. So it's not the best one. The best one is the schedule performance index. Hope that makes sense. All right. We're almost done here. Let's go to our next one. Which metric is best for checking variances in the schedule? Now it's getting simpler. All right, my friends, three, two, and one. The best answer that I would have expected you to choose is schedule variance. It's that simple. I just gave you a whole bunch of time. You didn't need it. The answer is schedule variance. It's not the performance indices. When you're checking variances, you need one of the Vs, SV, CV, so on and so forth. When it comes to schedule, schedule variance. When it comes to cost, cost variance. All right, here we go. Here's your next one. The actual cost of work performed is known as what? All right. Three, two, and one. The best answer to this is not the earned value. 
or the plan value. It's the actual cost. Remember, actual cost of work performed. Let's go to our next one. We're almost done here. Next one, the budgeted cost of work performed is known as what? Three, two, and one. Very obvious here. It's not the actual cost because we just talked about that, right? So we're down to two. Work performed. Plan values planned, not performed. So the best answer is EV. That's how you answer it. Let's go to our next one. This should go easy now. The budgeted cost of work scheduled is known as. This is so easy. Three, two, one. Well, we know it's not the actual cost because it says budgeted cost. And we know it's not the budgeted cost of work performed because we just did earned value. So the answer is planned value. What is scheduled? Planned, scheduled, if you get it. Cool. Let's move to our next one. Soft logic is known as what? That's a pretty easy one. So soft logic is also known as it's not internal and it's not mandatory. The answer is discretionary dependency. So a discretionary dependency is based on what you perceive the work to be. It is dependent on the observer. It is not based on the order of the work. So that's that. You've got a few questions left. Here's your next one. Hard logic is also known as what? Very, very simple at this point. answer to this, my friends, of course, it's not discretionary because we just talked about that, and it's not internal either. It's mandatory. Mandatory is also known as hard logic. Now, discretionary that we talked about just now, remember, it's known as soft logic. It's also known as preferential logic, just so you know. All right, my friends, we are almost completely done. Here's your next one, your final one. In Scrum, the most common duration for a sprint is what? Three? Two? And one. All right. So the answer, my friends, is not eight weeks. Definitely not. Four weeks is the limit, but it's not the most common in industry. In industry, the most common, and this is in the APG as well, it is two weeks. My friends, you've gone through 35 questions. You sat tight. You rode with me. Well done. I hope this helps you fine-tune your focus. If you have enjoyed these questions, 
go ahead and hit that bell icon so you're notified when I've got more videos like this. And go ahead and hit the like button and share with your friends so they know this is available. I made this kind of intermediate so that you needed to have some knowledge but not over the top. So it's a nice in the middle ground kind of quiz to help those who are very early in the process to level up to intermediate, all right? If you found this to be. All right, um, that was a lesson in how to take a five minute video and make it 40 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the, uh, the long pauses and silence late in the day. For those of you that were at work at four o'clock this morning, I think that that was a little bit tough. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to read you one or two things that I brought the topic up, and I think that uh, it was interesting uh, to a couple of you. I was just reading your body language when we were talking about it. I've got three things that um, St. George, this is open payrolls. This is just internet search. St. George, Utah employee salaries in 2018. Gary Esplin was the city manager. He made $309,544.59. Uh, Sean Guzman was the city attorney. He made $208,945. And there's a list there in order in 2018. Now, they got some raises in the meantime. Uh, the St. George, Utah highest paid employees for St. George City uh, reported 248 employees that make more than $100,000 per year. In our town, 248 people make more than $100,000 a year. That's current. That's in 2022. Uh, there's some good jobs out there. <laughs> they, they just got all sucked up. You, you, how do you get one of those? Well, uh, they're different, there's different paths, right? Somebody at the water treatment plant makes 100. Somebody in the power plant, uh, come, uh, Dick, uh, not Dixie Power, that's the other guy. St. George City Power makes 100 back. Actually, in power, there's more than one. Uh, that make that, and the, the person that makes the most in the power department is female. Uh, for those that think that there's gender bias, there's uh, some glass ceilings in Southern Utah, for sure. Uh, that's not one of them. But the, the piece that, that uh, this is KSL News on October 31st of 2022, St. George's city manager is receiving a $625,000 payout from the city to leave his position. <laughs> now, in my world, we fire people. <laughs> we don't pay them $625,000 to stay home. We just don't do that. So I'm not making a political statement here. Uh, some of that seems a little jacked up to me. Some of it is, hard, it is earned the hard way. Some of, those, some of those jobs that pay 100 uh, are underpaid when you compare it to the same job in a long run. There's litigation involved in that, though. There is litigation. That's why, yeah. yeah, yeah they're like, here, go away. That's a payoff. We, we're, yeah, yeah. we're doing this because if we fire you, you'll sue us for law. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah I agree. I understand. It's still a dang lot of money. And if you compare our budget uh, in St. George to the city of Provo, which is about the same population, and you'll find that Provo doesn't have near as many high paying jobs as St. George does. And that's, that is a political statement. You may feel on one side or the other. I'm not trying to, to, to but we as citizens of the town we live in uh, can impact that kind of stuff. If you don't agree with that, if you think that's messed up, uh, let the city council know. Let, you know let, let the people that represent us know. And say, hey, this is out of balance. No wonder our taxes are high in Washington County or whatever. You know? And so, so you know, we, this is where we live. We, we need to. We need to be involved to some degree uh, with guiding it based on the beliefs that we have. And I'm not telling you if it's right or wrong. I'm saying weigh in on stuff like this. This is our neighborhood. We can't change Washington, D.C. as easily as we can change Washington, Utah. And, and so that, that's a little thought there. All right, we've, we've sat in the dark at night uh, listening to questions. What's left is I want you to get a laptop. If you need to take a break, please do that. We're gonna, you're going to be dismissed. As soon as you master enough of the game to feel comfortable with it, but take a break if you need it by all means. 
grab a laptop in the back of the room, and when you get the laptop, I want to walk you through a website that I want you to go to. So if you've got that piece of paper, I'm going to repeat when the rest of the guys get back in. Uh, if you've got that piece of paper in front of you, write this one down so you can take it home and have the address. Uh, if you've got really good eyes, you can see it on the top of the web page. It's on the screen. If you don't have eyes that good, we'll see how you do with green on white contrast. Uh, the, the capitals and lowercase is doesn't matter on web, the, these web pages. So use all lowercase. For simplicity, HTTPS colon front slash front slash. That's the way all websites start out if you hadn't noticed that before. Spell F O R I O dot com front slash. Keep it going. APP front slash. MIT front slash. Project management hyphenated, no spaces in between, project management, front slash, hashtag, front slash, and then hit enter. And that should take you to a page that looks eerily similar to this one. Uh, if you need, if you're on these laptops, password protected? What's unprotected? Um, DXATC11 with a capital D. See if that opens the laptop. If it doesn't, I'm happy. I'm happy to find somebody that's smarter than me. Jake can't have to hack it. Did that get you in? Yep. Okay. All right. D up right there. Jake goes out and he knows stinking password. Password DXATC11 with capital D. So here's some food for thought about you know, people who make a lot of money. In America, the top five careers for people who have a million dollars or more in their bank account are engineers, accountants, slash CPAs, teachers, management, and attorneys. Did you say teacher? So I don't think so. <laughs> so Dave Ramsey pulled uh, anybody just sent out and, and stuff like that. And the top five careers of uh, people that replied to this poll, that was them. Wow. And it said 31% average $100,000 a year over the course of their careers. And a third never made six figures in a single work year of their careers. Wow. So basically they just worked and saved, worked and saved, worked and saved. That is really interesting. So. so you can get there either way, mm -hmm. but you can't get there by playing and partying. And then the, uh, <laughs> uh, there is a myth of like trust fund babies and stuff like that. I mean, it's actually a very low percentage of millionaires are trust fund. It's um, yeah. the majority of them are hard work. Yeah, so. that's interesting. That's that's very interesting uh, stuff, and that means there's hope for everybody. America is a place of opportunity for those that uh, Eli were talking about, and I were talking about this before class. That the issue of 
of living within your means. Uh, and as our means are meager and we get more means, it's tempting to you know, spend more. And at some point in time, people overspend their means and then they're in trouble financially. And so if you're a parent, that's probably the most valuable thing to teach your kids is not to do that. And it's not as fun <laughs> to not spend money, but it's sure less stress and longer lives if you can uh, live within your means. And, and even uh, people that uh, make uh, very little, which we've all had our moments in our lives when we made very little, uh, and we somehow were able to be uh, most of the time happy. Oh, that's kind of interesting. I think back to times when I could move in, in the back of my pickup truck. I could move everything I owned. And, uh, and it was, life was simple in a way. I didn't have stuff, and it wasn't fun from that point of view, but uh, core happiness is, is not how much, uh, how many trinkets we have. It's really more how many relationships we have. All right, I'm going to repeat for those of you that just came back in, uh, the website that we are looking for, get a laptop. <coughs> the laptop should be password protected, I, I'm hearing. The password should be DSATC11 with a capital D. If that does not work, I'd say go get another laptop. <laughs> uh, once you get in, you're going to write this web address down. Uh, I'm going to repeat it out loud so you don't have to try to copy and read the, my printing in green ink. Uh, low contrast is my choice here. Uh, so these are all lowercase letters. HTTPS colon front slash front slash. That's how all URLs in the World Wide Web start out. Then you're going to spell F-O-R-I-O dot com front slash, I'm going to keep going, APP front slash, MIT front slash, project management hyphen A, P R O J E C T hyphen M A N A G E M E N T front slash, hashtag front slash. If you're like me, that's not a hashtag, that's a pound sign. <laughs> On an old school telephone. All right, so once you do all that, you hit enter. And that should take you to this web page. We are not administering an existing class. Even though you are a class, it's not part of a class. Uh, we're, we are not uh, an educator registration code or anything. We are students. And we are going to click on the play as an individual. And when you play as an individual, you get a drop down that says choose a screen ID, which you can make one up. Put in Dixie Teacher for me. And then you hit the green tab, start the simulation. At that point, you will have a choice of three simulations that you can choose from. They are not the same, uh, but they have a similar approach and similar idea. You can be a project manager of a large construction project, and it's going to include two phases, a design phase and a build phase. Or you can select hardware. You're going to manage the development of new consumer electronic product, and you'll show up at Vegas show. Uh, that also will have a design, development, and producing production uh, phase to it, two phases. The software, uh, you can choose a software project. You're going to manage the development of new commercial software product with a team of developers. So you can choose which one of those you want to do. And uh, what I'd like you to do before you commit and choose for now, this is going to be just yucks and grins. I want you to get to the point where you kind of get what the software is asking you to do. Uh, and so uh, I want us to kind of play along on once. Uh, and so I'm going to choose 
uh, man, uh, manufacturing hardware, and I'd like you to choose that now because you can start this over again just by clicking start over. So let us all in the class for right now before you go home pick the same one so we kind of read together the, the, the way the project is going to be set up, the choices that we'll have to make. So I'm clicking on hardware, and the first thing we need to do in hardware on the bottom right thing is we need to enter the name of your project. And so you can name it, this is hardware, so uh, we're gonna, I'm going to call mine a gizmo of some sort. And that's the, the, the name of the project. But before that, uh, I want us to kind of look at what all is scroll down. There's, there's about a page. If you hit uh, begin simulation, you'll have a chance to come back and reread this in, in an index tag. So let's do that. Let's click begin simulation. And now the simulation, we have a dashboard. It, it kind of, it kind of, defaults into some written stuff. But if we click on intro there, uh, we get an opportunity to see that same introduction that we saw a minute ago. We'll come back to that. This is going to give you your background and a little bit about the project. We'll read that together in a minute. But let's click across, across these tabs to start with. The dashboard itself uh, has the project scheduling, it has information that's, uh, it, it puts your deadlines in there. This project is estimated to complete in 48 weeks, and you're going to be able to advance one week at a time. So 48 clicks if you want to, but as we start, and we're not started yet, but when we do start, we can ad advance two weeks, we can advance four weeks, or you could set up a scenario and you can go straight to the end and see what would have happened if you'd have kept and not changed anything all the way through 48 clicks. You can see if you'd have made money, lost money, got fired, or what. Um, and we have, you're able to select your workforce. You can add people to phase A or phase B. You can increase pressure from management. You know, you can turn up the heat. You can back off pressure from management which has to do with morale, attitude, that kind of stuff. You can dial up more quality. You can back off on quality, and there's a trade-off there with speed of completion, obviously. The more quality you put in, the slower the work goes. Uh, you can add proposed new features, which might give you an estimated increase in market share because you got more razzle-dazzle on your product. Uh, you can <coughs> reduce the project scope up to a third if you want to, and, and there may be a consequence of that that involves uh, a loss of market share that they're going to track. You can accelerate the work. Uh, there's a, a, a percent maximum uh, that, which is 100. You can't triple the work. You can, you can go double, though. And, and there will be a scale here that tells you if you accelerate, about how much time is going to be saved. 1.3 weeks if I accelerate 30%, for example. You can click a restart the game if you learn something you want to try again. Over here, you're going to be tracking the project progress. And the, the chart that's going to come out of here is going to be color coded, uh, not started, uh, known rework being produced, uh, waiting testing, approved, completed, released minimum viable project product uh, at that point. This, this shows uh, you can expand the chart if you want to make the status so you can see 0 to 100% where you're at. Uh, you can look at the human resource aspect of what, you, what you're using in terms of productivity, uh, how many people, how many work hours or man hours are putting in. Uh, you can, you, can uh, uh, you, you have a graph here that shows experienced employees, rookies, and uh, experienced uh, FTEs. You have project scope data down here about whether you're increasing your, whether the initial scope has, uh, how it compares to where your current scope is at if you've expanded or retracted. Your financials, your project cost versus budget, where you at, you upside down. Uh, your projected lifetime revenue and profit 
So what contribution is happening uh, to the organization based on you managing that project? You can click on the planning tab, and on the planning tab we have a schedule and staff area, and we have a costs and budget area. So on the management, uh, the schedule and staff, we have a deadline of 48 weeks for this project. Initial project scope is 72,000 tasks. So each task takes one hour. So you have 72,000 hours for phase A and 33,600 hours required for phase B. Uh, you have scope, work remaining, uh, phase start date, end dates that you can control. Uh, the durations are established. Anytime you want to click on one of these eyes, it will tell you a, de a, a definition of what that, uh, that particular term uh, is talking about. And uh, you get estimated staff required. Now, the other tab under this tab is the costs and the budget. And so if you have that divided into phase A, and phase B, here's where you see one task is one person hour. Uh, the estimated labor to do this project, 4.8 million uh, for phase A and 2.3 million for phase B. Uh, your weekly overheads, uh, your estimated overhead cost to complete, uh, material cost per task. So on the build side, $150 per task, and remember we had 36,000 there, so that's, these numbers get pretty big, uh, pretty quick. Fixed costs are there, and you can, you can evaluate those. You can get some reports out that are simply graphs that uh, get, show your project where it's at to date. You can expand on each of those graphs if you want, uh, and, and uh, uh, look at it in, in less than microfilm. Uh, you can look at the human resources aspect, the project scope aspect, and the financial aspect. You will be getting messages. Uh, you can you get messages from CEO like, see me, I'm not pleased with your progress. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And so you have to check your emails uh, on this with that tab as you go through your project. As you do as you learn, it will record your past runs and it will show what you did last time if you do the project over again. It'll see if you can see if you increase, and then when you want to quit, you can log out. Uh, so back to the introduction. Let's read this together. Let you play with it for a little bit with a neighbor. I want I want you to team up with two or three of you and play. Uh, just kind of get an idea of what happens when you do this, what happens when you do that. Those of you that are natural gamers, uh, you I would expect your learning curve to be less than others. Uh, but let's read through all of these words here. Uh, together, we'll start uh, in the back of the room. Brendan, we'll start with you. We're on the introduction uh, tab here, and where it says, Welcome to the MIT. This is the real MIT, by the way. This is Massachusetts Institute of Technology, perhaps one of the better engineering schools in the world. Uh, very difficult to get in, very expensive. This is their game, uh, and uh, they own it. Your background, read the first few sentences or paragraph then uh, the next person to you uh, carry on and let's together read through this page. Uh, Brennan, take off.
can skip you, Denver, right now because you had to go out and get some pizza made for some people, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Pro Pro Papa John's. <laughs> Eli, go ahead. The dashboard provides an overview of your project. Click on the reports tab or any or on any graph in the dashboard to access more detailed data on project scope and progress, human resources, and your financials. 
Finally, be sure to check your email. Members of the team, including people from the marketing, human resources, and quality assurance departments, will be sending you important updates and making recommendations throughout the game. You may also receive emails from your boss. Click the I symbol mm -hmm. throughout the sim for information explaining each item. You can advance week by week, several weeks at a time, or all the way to the end of the project. After each game, you should examine the results, formulate a new strategy, and then restart to see if you can make smarter decisions for a better outcome. And it says, good luck. Um, so if we, if we, I think I want to get done a little bit faster. So instead of 75 people to start with, I'm going to start with 85 people on B. When I get to that, I'm going to put 20 people on it. And I'm uh, going to accept the scope. I am going to go straight to the end and see what happens. And if I advance to the end, which I think I did, uh, I see results. Your work, it says Dixie Teacher, that's me. Your work did not meet our expectations. Please come and see me as soon as possible to review what went wrong. Uh, it looks like I wound up uh, losing market share. Uh, we lost $67 million. Uh, lifetime profits negative. Uh, I suspect the boss really does want to talk to me because you, you can see uh, from what's there that it was a pretty dismal project. If we wanted to... Uh, uh, look at the messages. Here's the messages I received during that 48 weeks. I got messages from QA, from marketing, urgent from the CEO. Uh, you know, I'm in trouble. And uh, you can look at the reports that show where we tanked money. Um, we that, that was badly managed. Uh, we actually probably ran out of money on that one. HR shows our human uh, uh, effort the scope effort uh, uh, and, and our financials. You see we had a real problem at the end of uh, A and B, and we went negative early uh, on, on uh, revenues there. So I'm bad project manager doing it that way. So I, I can restart the game. Uh, I can choose a new scenario if I want. I can restart the one that I just did. And uh, uh, and go for it. So what I want you guys to do is slide around so you've got uh, two or three of you kind of together. Uh, you can pick a different scenario if you want now. Uh, I just wanted us all to kind of go through that one. The, the verbiage is similar for each of the three scenarios, but pick one that your, your neighbor uh, that you're together on. Uh, fool around with a few simulation starts, see what happens, kind of talk about it a little bit. See if you can figure out what the triggers and indicators are. A little bit. When you think you got a handle on it, uh, put your computer back in the cabinet and enjoy your weekend. I will see you on Tuesday uh, at uh, a normal time. Uh, hang out as long as you want. I'm not sending anybody out. But I'd like, to, I'd like you to uh, do the simulation to the point where you don't get fired. You know, I got fired in the one I did. I, you know, that, I lost a ton of money. And when you get a simulation to that point, take a snapshot of it with your cell phone and post it on Canvas and give it to me, just to the scoreboard. And, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So it's a homework assignment uh, during, between now and Tuesday. I want you to kind of spend a little bit of time being a project manager under MIT's simulation. And if you've got friends and family uh, that you want to share with and screw around with it, uh, Go for it. That's that's completely fine. Give them a little exposure to what you're learning and what you're mastering as a uh, as a project uh, manager. So get together with a couple other people. I'll turn the lights up a little bit since it's got dark outside. <coughs> figure out I figured out enough. I'm thinking. I got to know. Your team is putting in long hours in the tech one, and I'm like, it's all crap. <laughs> hey, it's still just called Crunch. <laughs>
He's fine with it. So he was talking to me about it, and I was like, oh, I'm like being unloaded on all of a sudden. Like, it good. Yeah, it's a shame that that's hush hush yeah. because everybody knows. Yeah, I, it's a shame because you know, it, it's something for us to wear. Well, it could. Yeah. Like, it's totally such could. easily played as a game. Yeah. Hey, yeah. You know, and, and I think that's how they should handle it. Like, yeah, hey, there's a struggle thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, we're not asking. First step is to find out what well, and that's what you can do. Yeah, I mean they're known as Salt Lake City to remove it. I mean they're oh, they are they're yeah, gonna yeah, so yeah. take it out. That's or at least apparently. open up and see what it is. Yeah. Perhaps <laughs> even open it to start with the baby yeah. lab because our insurance was refusing. It's an estimated new productivity one year. The insurance effectively died. Like well, it's it's cheaper for us if you just keep it take a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean it was just bullets are two bucks. <laughs> So the priorities change about what matters in the company and what matters in our lives. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. and it's hard being in a position where I'm, like, waiting for people to leave and being, like, yeah. wasn't exactly waiting for them. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, I, there's, like, a yeah. guilt that comes with that where I'm, like, oh, mm-hmm. You wish you got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, like, a buddy yeah. of mine was talking about how he was, like, I really was, mm-hmm. I was waiting for the whole Russia attention to be over with. They just started. And then the next day they started it. And he was like, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, yeah, I know, I know Jeff is like not doing the best of her, but like, he was full on crying at Christmas party during it. We were talking about family, and everyone was like, well, it's family. But it, it brought a different light to it. Whose daughter came in? Sometimes yeah. 
prices
talk just for a second about experience so far. Anybody been not fired? A couple of you have been not fired? Okay. What was the trick? Well, they still want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> what went wrong? <laughs> it was uh, playing with the sliders for quality and progress a hell of a lot between leagues. Just reading the emails and then looking through all of the charts and trying to get a gauge on so what's it going on. It wasn't just going click, 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 because yeah. status quo is not going to work. No, it's constantly changing. So it's constantly having to swap. At least that's what I had to do. And then also, they want you to add like every proposed feature ever known to mankind. And even then, you might not add all the proposed features they want. So. True. Anybody else got some experience with those does it? Well, for me, it's like, you read the emails, I can listen to what they say, and you're like, hey, you put pressure on your team, all right, so uh, let's manage our pressure, or they're working too many hours, all right, so you bring the quality down a little bit, add more people, right? Um, or you're, I, I haven't had, I, I'm good up until like the last two weeks. those or calculating those, uh, you know, go a little slower because you gotta you gotta do a little more thinking between cycles. And 75 is a long way out. 48 is a little shorter, uh, you know, to uh, to manage. But uh, the longer project on uh, uh, 75 weeks out, if you get to the construction one, uh, choose that is a little bit more uh, money's more, uh, but with a little bit longer time ramp. You have a little more reaction time, if you would, to bring the project in. It is possible to bring them in ahead of schedule and under budget. So I'll just dangle that out. That's a possibility. I mean, we're going for not getting fired. But, <laughs> you know, uh, that's a good place to start. But understand, even after you can drive the thing in successfully, uh, you at the at the at the last minute, that's that's not the optimum. The optimum is to be able to drive the project below budget and, uh, and early, if you can. Now, this one is, is, is keeping in mind the impact on the market. So some bad decisions that not add features cost you market share, and that's a bad score. So ultimately, not just bringing in on time, but you want the project to actually win in the marketplace when you release it. So you gotta bring it in, and, and this algorithm will give you some indicator on how well you're doing that, based on your judgment call of what was worth adding and what wasn't worth adding. And that comes from reading your email. And they'll give you an idea. And if you don't, if you disregard them, uh, I, I think that part of the punishment is that you disregarded an email. <laughs> you know, you didn't, you didn't listen to the marketing department, what they were telling you, and the CEO is watching that. And I think you get whacked. I'm not sure how the algorithm works, but I've experienced all of the frustrations that you all are uh, noticing with this. So fiddle around with it, keep fiddling around with it. Again, you can hang out here as long as you want. Um, but uh, I'd like you to have some level of success uh, before Tuesday if you can. I can't. Uh, if you like to wait that last two weeks, it should be a nice change. 
I want to shut the screen there, the demo screen, and do it this way. It should be going this way.